um, an online course viewer for the modern manual therapy um, upper quarter, lower quarter seminar had a really good question. And I think that's why I called you guys together. Fred is clearly frustrated at some of his patients. So he basically says, and, and you guys, I need your opinion on this too, because there's probably no right or wrong answer. So I was wondering what you tell your clients that say, you were the expert, you tell me. Then when you give them your expert recommendation slash explanation, they argue. So he, he, he further goes on to say, specific examples are patient. Do I get heat and stim? Me. Do you want heat and stim? Patient. You tell me you're the expert. Me. Your pain level has decreased significantly and the modalities will help for a little bit, but the best way to treat pain is to do exercises every hour. Then the patient asks the PTA if she should have modalities, and of course the expert is overruled. So let's start oh. let's start with this case first. Okay. I'm assuming this is some semblance of a real case, and hopefully this has only happened once. But if this is happening more than once, I think there's there's a few problems here. What would what would you guys say is the first problem? So if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, the the patient asked, "Am I going to get modalities today?" And the therapist's first response was, "Do you want it today?" Right. Yeah, that that the patient says, "You tell me. You're the expert." And then yeah. we said, well, you're getting better. And honestly, the best way to continue to get better is to do the exercises every hour. Okay. So, I mean, my first comment is by responding in that way to the first question, you've already kind of relinquished some of your expertise in the sense of you're now asking the patient whether or not they want it versus in that instance where they ask you being very you know, firm and saying, no, I don't think you need it. And here's why that extra question by the therapist almost opens the avenue for doubt in the patient's mind, or at least that's my experience. When I was a younger clinician earlier on, I would, I don't want to say I wanted to try to please every patient, but I wanted to try to make sure they had a good experience. So if I asked that question, I always felt that I didn't have um, as much buy-in or control over that situation. I would agree with that. And what, what, what does the lead faculty for modern patient education say? Interestingly enough, uh, I'm actually going to take the opposite approach in that early on, I was probably a little bit more, um, I think, confident in saying no that you don't need this, I was less likely to try to necessarily please the patient. But I think now in terms of what I've been reading in terms of match, you know, meeting patient expectations, therapeutic alliance, there's certainly a certain balance of give and take in terms of, you know, the patient doesn't get everything they want. We're not always, always right about what patients need. And so it's, it's, there's a, there's a somewhere in between type of thing. Uh, I think the one, you know, part of the thing from the story is missing is what what was the previous visits like? So what were the pre what was the previous patient experience like? What is the current relationship of the patient mm -hmm. with the physical therapist in terms of were they had they already received modalities? Were they expecting to receive modalities because they've been given modalities in the previous visits, or had they been given previous modalities at another with another physical therapy? clinic or clinician. So, you know, kind of it's on us as the practitioner to uh, really gauge the, the patient's expectations on what they are really looking for. And, and as it, you know, plainly states expecting from uh, that experience. Right. So it's one of those things where, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a tough call. I, I think asking the patient, do they want it or are they expecting it is not necessarily the wrong thing to do, but it, it really depends on somewhat of the context of the overall uh, uh, experience in the relationship between the two of them. Do you think there would be a better way to ask that question? 
Right. Well, I, what I what I was gonna say. Um, Why do you think it, you need it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Why do you actually think you need these modalities? And if they say, "Well, it's gonna make me better," then you could launch into why you really think you don't need them. But asking them, "Do you think you need them?" Truthfully, that does give up your power, or like Kyle said, relinquish some of your power as the expert. And even. Um, there's there is a fine line definitely treading between patient expectations and patient wants and definitely um, using placebo to your advantage and also giving up your power as an expert because patient is coming to you for help and if they thought that you couldn't help them then you all of a sudden there's nocebo spread all over this visit instead of placebo Uh, yeah i would agree with that and i I think I think the, uh, by asking them why do they think they need it, sometimes it's just because that's what's been done. So there's that. It's just the habit. It's just the, you know, the course of action of what they've been experiencing. And then putting the ball in their court makes them have to think for themselves and articulate and sometimes have the realization, no, I actually don't need it because I am feeling better. You know, and they, they come to that t- conclusion on their own, which is sometimes even more powerful versus being right. told by somebody else. Right. Um, what, what I would also say is if you've had this in the past and you've had this in other visits and you're still here and you're still symptomatic, what do you think those are really doing for you? I mean, there's nothing magical about our heat and our ice. Um, stimulation might be something that they can't get at home. And the perception there is that it's you know, more therapeutic than just heat or stim. But uh, what I would like to say is there's, there's a transient effect to everything. And the more, almost the more rapid an effect you have relief with whatever it is, the more rapid the relief is going to go away unless you do something to keep it. I've had a similar situation, not with uh, manipulation. And Erson, you may have had, you know, you guys may have had, had manipulated somebody a few times because it's had a effect and they kind of want it every time they come back. You know, at, at a certain point, it's we all like we know with the transient effects of manual therapy as well. It's like, well, it's great to do it. And, it's, and there, there's a there's a little bit of an ego thing when a patient wants a skill that you can provide. But at the same time, it's well, if that's if it's if we have to do it every time, what is it really doing again? You know, are, we're, are we missing a piece during, during the treatment or are you not doing something that we've been talking about doing that should be maintaining some of the, the effects of what we've been doing? Right. I always bring in the financial aspect to it, too. And I think, again, my patients, since they're cash pay and they're typically paying me, you know, up to like four or five times more than what their copay could possibly be, they tend to be a little bit more incentivized to do whatever I tell them. But back when I was HMO based and I would see people, you know, for copays essentially or seeing no fault patients who didn't have any copay. I um, well, I guess it didn't matter for them. But even the ones who were paying copay, I would make it financial. Like, like I would be happy to treat you and take your money forever. But if you actually want to get better and not see me or another physical therapist or another chiropractor or massage therapist, you know, save some money and try doing these exercises or the homework that I gave you every hour for a week and see what happens. I'm like it's as close to a magic bullet as I could possibly give you. So let's see. Fred actually had another example, actually. Urson, real quick, at the end of that, was didn't the the pe- didn't they try to shift the question to someone else? Oh, was- yeah that that is a whole that's the other problem. Another big good, problem. Good cop, bad the, cop. Right, and not even good cop, bad cop. We're gonna actually go a little political here. And trust me, I've had some amazing and I've worked with amazing PTAs. But when the patient asks the PTA for something that the PT said they didn't need and the PTA just gives it to them, that's an issue. A very big issue. Right. Uh, There's a reason. Hey, if you wanted to become a physical therapist and make physical therapy type decisions and change the treatment plan, then go to physical therapy school. <laughs> right. If the PTA knew that the PT already 
ch you know establish whatever they're going to establish and they go around the PT, that's a major problem. If they didn't know that the, the, the patient and the PT already had a conversation, at the very least, they should ask the PT or defer, say, well, let me just check with the physical therapist or did you already talk to the physical therapist before, you know, rendering a response? Right. That would be the appropriate answer. And you're so political and I just immediately assumed the PTA was undermining the PT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually not my default mode. It's my thoughtful mode. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So if Fred could vent a little bit more, he basically says the patient has low back pain with history of a coflex procedure, L405, status post four years. He basically does a SFMA uh, movement screen. Certain things are positive. His back actually moves very well. And the patient, uh, Fred says, so the problem seems to be more of a stability issue in the hip and pelvis and the foot and ankle. And that may be creating tension in your back. Is there anything else you would like to go over? And the patient says, aren't you going to look at my back? And Fred says, I did, and it moves well. You also had surgery to treat the back pain. I think to continue to look at the back will not help us address the pain. And the patient looks at me as if I just killed his dog. <laughs> <laughs> and the way he re his rant is basically, I feel that PTs are perceived as technicians that do what the surgeons, MDs, DC mm -hmm. order in South Florida anyway. So again, I think there's more than one issue going on there. Um, but it's, it's overall perception, at least in the area that he works, is that he believes that the patient's perception of PTs are just technicians. What do you guys think about that? I'm sure we've all encountered that, right? Of course. Uh, you know, it, it's, I think it's, it's challenging from, again, it, has to go, it goes back to expectations. And sometimes it's hard during the initial evaluation to get the patient's expectations of overall of what physical therapy is and then you know of what they think you know this physical therapy is going to be um you know the, the challenge is sort of that with you know regional interdependence which sfma is kind of a regional interdependence model and this is something i've talked to with new grads about is that more often than not especially with an initial eval it's probably better to err on the side of caution and certainly exhaust a uh, examination approach on the area that the patient has complaints in and making sure that the patient feels like that part has been fully addressed, even if we don't think that that might be the quote unquote driver of some of, of their symptoms. Um, if, you know, in his mind, he may have done a thorough examination because of what his current knowledge and training is, but in the patient's mind, it might've been perceived as being a cursory examination because it wasn't touched or mobilized or palpated, just going through movement. And that might be why he had the, the patient had that response. Right. That's, that's a really good point. I, I mean, I think, I think sometimes we forget as physical therapists, especially if you're in a higher volume clinic and you're trying to go through patients and you have this philosophy and process that you go through and you know in your head that you're giving a good eval, like you said, Andrew, uh, the patient's looking at you as someone that you, they don't know you, they don't know where, how your brain works. And, and um, you know, it, it is helpful to allow the patient to have an experience, certainly in the evaluation where they feel like you're touching uh, upon every area that could potentially be uh, involved. And so we may not think that the back may be an issue, but, and I'm not saying just, you know, like as Erson says, press and guess, just like do it just for fun, just to, to make them feel like their back was touched, but, you know, really choose some, some tests and measures that may actually be helpful to your evaluation, but at the very least are targeted to that area. So the patient feels, okay, they, they've addressed that. And then it becomes more of a, credence to the way that you're thinking that you say, look, I looked there and I didn't really find anything, but I did find this stuff. And my experience and knowledge shows me this. And if we work on this, it will be more beneficial. Yeah. I would say by the time, I mean, he, if he actually did an SFMA, he actually looked at some sort of forward bending, backward bending and twisting 
And um, I don't know what the patient was expecting, right? I mean, they might have expecting some palpation-based test or some, I, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> Well, if they've had PT before, it, uh, that could obviously sway that as well. If they've had PT that wasn't um, like the SFMA or, or that type of screening and, and evaluation, uh, clearly their expectations are already based on something that, that he may not do. And so you're already right. kind of set up for failure in that way. Yeah, it, it's hard because by the time he finished his examination, the patient already had a, uh, a, con- a preconception of what he expected physical therapy to be, and it didn't go that way. And because it didn't go that way, then all of a sudden Fred lost his authority as a clinician. Um, and that's kind of hard to get back on first impression. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like first impressions are everything. And, and what I can tell you, Fred, and anyone else who's listening or watching out there and just having similar issues is that you're not going to win over every patient. And uh, every patient, they absolutely have the right to ask you, well, what do you think? You're the expert. But there, there are certain ways that you can play into their expectations and also uh, that will help enhance their evaluation. But you shouldn't, it's not a la carte. It's what I always tell my students and mentees. PT is an a la carte. You can't just like, as a patient, just give them like a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And all of a sudden the patient is dictating this. Like, what about this trigger point? Oh, and can you rub here? And you're just chasing the pain around and you're actually not making any clinical decisions. So again, like Andrew originally went back to, there is a fine line of balance between confidence uh, and also authority, but playing into the patient's expectations of what they want, because that will actually enhance your outcomes because patient preference has been shown to actually enhance outcomes. And it also develops therapeutic alliance, and that's going to improve your outcomes. So I wish there was an easy way to answer this, but there's not. No, there's not. And it, and, and the answer that we would suggest for this one, um, if you had an identical patient who had the, the same exact script go through, uh, that might not work on them, right? It may, so it really is a, um, a mindset where you have to get into that you want to try to help everyone and ha- want everyone to have a good experience, but that's not always the case. And that's okay. Yeah. Like that's normal. That's not, you, you did nothing wrong. It's just sometimes, you know, it's that, that therapeutic alliance is not going to be ever met between you and that patient. And maybe it's a different therapist that can, can reach that with them in the clinic or even, you know, refer out to a different clinic where, you know, you have a colleague or former classmate that would get along with them. Um, I think that's the, the best thing that we could hope for in that instance where we can't build that that if we can at least set them in the right direction, um, we're, we're, we're guiding them towards getting better. I just said that at my last course, right? I said, yes, if, you did. if uh, myself and a couple of other more experienced clinicians, basically uh, during a Q and A were asked, is there anything you would give like just non-standard advice that you haven't heard before, but you wish you had heard a long time ago. And I said, yeah, honestly, if you don't get along with the patients and it's like one of those patients where you look at your schedule and you feel like a pit in your stomach when you see their name on it and you know, they don't like you, you don't like them. It's not like you hate each other, but they're just, they're not listening to you. They're not being compliant. They question everything you say you probably just shouldn't see that patient. You should refer them to someone who will probably address their needs or maybe is a nicer person to you or cooler or funnier or whatever. I don't know. (laughs) Whatever they need that you cannot give them. We we have, we have two new grads in our, in our office right now. And that's, I gave basically gave them that same speech that over the past couple of weeks is that in those situations, and it applies to us too, because you, you have that patient and sometimes it's, yeah, is just trying the right match at the right time, and you know the people that want to kind of they gel, and sometimes you just don't gel with people. Yeah, I've had patients actually thank me for referring me to someone who got them better, even though they ended up with ultrasound and he's him on the shoulder. 
And one one thing that can be helpful, a very simple thing, and I don't know if you guys do this, is and I don't necessarily do this every time, but sometimes simply asking the patient, "What do you think is going on?" Okay. And and that is very direct, but also gives an idea of where their head's at. If they say, "Oh, I think it's a pinched nerve," okay, or I think it's a you know whatever the doctor told them, you know, bulging disc or herniated disc or whatever it might, piriformis syndrome, whatever it might be at least it starts that conversation and then you get an idea of where they're thinking and almost what that is. So if they think it's piriformis syndrome, well, I'm going to be sure that during my evaluation, I'm going to be doing stuff yeah. that helps me confirm or, you know, rule out that it really is unlikely that, but then they ha they get the feeling that I also examined that and did the appropriate test to confirm that, yeah, this is really not what it is, but what I think it is, is blah, blah, blah. Right. I, what I think, um, everyone should do is when a patient schedules with you, they should be emailed Greg Lehman's recovery strategies ebook. <laughs> Cause everyone who schedules with me, they get an email that says, Hey, thank you for scheduling with edge rehab and sports science located in Buffalo, New York. And they get emailed. Hey, um, a couple of my videos to watch on like pain science type videos. And also here's a book that I want you to read and I want you to read it and come with questions. But even yeah. starting with that and starting the conversation before they even walk in your office, they already start to be challenged. And um, there's uh, a podcast I've been listening to, and uh, it's Clear and Vivid with Alan Alda, and I highly recommend at least the more clinical ones, the ones based, the ones with researchers, not the one with like actors and actresses, because those ones are kind of useless. But there was one researcher on there who he laugh, laughingly calls scientists. Like when I think when I think of scientists, I think they're wearing lab coats and they have like beakers behind with bubbling things that like with colored liquids that go in the. I just think of like cartoon scientists, like Willy Wonka, right? And uh, the one scientist said, "There's four steps essentially to presenting new information and in, or new data to a patient." and having them be convinced. So the first step would be how much knowledge do they have about the subject that you're trying to change? Whatever it's a herniated disc or facet syndrome or myofascial pain syndrome or pelvis being out or something essentially pathoanatomically that hopefully you're trying to talk them out of. Uh, the second part is how strong of a conviction or a belief do they have mm -hmm. in the first, first part, right? So the third part is you presenting them with new evidence or data. And the fourth part is how strong of a belief or conviction do they have in the new evidence? And when parts three and four are really weak and part one is really strong, like the really strong belief that's been reinforced for 30 years of seeing pathoanatomical clinicians and getting passive care that temporarily improves them, you're not going to change this in one visit. Nope. So someone loves modalities, someone loves adjustments. They've been getting it forever and dishing out the dough. I probably wouldn't at this point be frustrated. I mean, I'd be frustrated in my head, but I wouldn't expect to make a quick change. And you can't possibly make a quick change on someone who has such strong convictions, no matter how incorrect they might be. That's a good point. We, we've been talking about what are the patient's expectations of PT, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves as PTs, what are our expectations? Like, just because we know, yeah, of the patients, right? Uh, it, how... Because, it's, again, it's very easy for us to know that the things that we do work and we can rattle through it in our brain. But we also have to take a step back and realize it's going to take some time for parts three and four of what you say to kind of seep in and marinate on their brain and make an impact if they are going to make an impact. And that's yeah, something that new grads have difficulty with that. I mean, certainly older therapists, seasoned uh, therapists as well, but. Definitely, I think that's something new grads, especially with me being at um, teaching at a university, um, I always see them in the fall after their first summer clinical. And 
one of the more common themes that I hear from them is, you know, I was frustrated I couldn't get X person better or I couldn't get them uh, better in as quick of a time as, um, as I thought I could. My answer to them is just what we were talking about before is that's okay. I mean, it's okay. You, you gotta, you gotta think of that as being okay, but also look at it as how can I improve that in the future? And sometimes it is about our expectations of the patient. We have to really take a look at our expectations. We can even think about how hard it is for us as clinicians sometimes to change our mindset on certain things. I mean, you have the people who are wed to, you know, uh, manipulating fascia and wed to SI joint stuff, stuff that has been, you know, overwhelmingly mm-hmm. shown in the evidence to not be the case, but there are still people who are really not going to change their mind about their approach to those concepts. And these are people who are, who do have the education, presumably, um, and, do, and, and do have and should have access to the information, but have a certain belief, very strong belief system, which is reinforced by, you know, confirmation bias of doing a certain treatment and getting a certain result. Right. And so it, it's, it's going to be even harder for patients who are getting that information from their physicians, from their friends and family, from the media, from Google searches. And how, how much are they getting inundated by that information versus the one time that we gave them, we talked to them about pain science. You know, it's not enough to always undo all that previous information and that previous experience. So it, it absolutely is going to take time. And it's going to take time for, through a lots of different things. Like Urson said, having them read something as well as having us tell them something, as well as us having them demonstrate to themselves that they can do something, such as bend over and pick something up off the floor. All that kind of stuff will gradually kind of percolate in there, hopefully. Right. You can't win them all, though. That's to try my best piece of advice. It's still frustrating to fail, but trust me, after 21 years, I don't beat myself up anymore. Yeah, you can still be frustrated and disappointed, but, you know, long gone are the days for me where I get super frustrated and really, like, beat myself up about it because it's just a fact. Sometimes you you, you cannot um, help everyone. Although, you know, I've had a few cases where I thought I did not help someone or I didn't help them as much as I thought I could have. And a year or two later, I ran into that person and they said that, you know what, I... I stop doing the things you said, but then I got back into them and I got into a groove and it ended up working. So sometimes you just never see that happy ending on the other side. Right. When someone doesn't see you again and they kind of leave it open like that, typically we think, unless we get that praise or that uh, yeah. conclusion mm-hmm. that, uh, oh, they, they, were, they just didn't want to see me again. It wasn't working. And right. that, is, that has absolutely happened to me before, too. Um, someone ended up sending me like three or four patients, and I only saw this guy once. And after like the third patient, I was like, hey, you know, this guy keeps on sending me referrals and, and just, tell him, just tell him thanks. But I, I honestly thought that uh, I didn't help him. And then, he, you know, he emailed me after this patient went home and said, hey, you know, I heard you, heard you thought that, um, I, it, you know, therapy didn't work or I didn't want to see you again, but I was just hundred percent better after one visit. And I, then I ended up having a baby and I just forgot to email you. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, babies take precedence over email. Oh uh, yeah. for sure. <laughs> and you know, everyone thank Kyle for his expertise tonight because his two kids are barfing. Yes. Oh yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I thought that, well, it's, it's one right now. Uh, I thought the other one was going for the for it too, but it seems we've staved it off for now. But yeah, you both know um, it's on its way. It is yeah. on its way. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be here if I had one kid barfing, probably. So kudos to you. No, no kudos to my wife. Well, All right, guys. Well, thanks one. for joining in. So. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight. We are the eclectic approach to modern rehab mastery. We have an online mentoring program. It's three months, one month with each mentor. I'm Dr. E with Modern Manual Therapy. And you guys are? Uh, Dr. That's Andrew Dr. Rothschild Andrew Rothschild. <laughs> modern Patient Education. Dr. Kyle Coffey, a Modern Strength Training, so blood flow restriction. All right. So we think we have a really comprehensive program. We go for manual therapy without all the minutia, without all the levels. Manual therapy can be easy. 
Kyle teaches BFR, one of the fastest, most evidence-based modalities in rehab and fitness today. Basically, if you move and strengthen people, you should really think about utilizing it. And Andrew teaches all the soft skills that you don't learn in any other course all combined into one. Mindfulness, sleep, recovery, movement, pain science in a practical way, patient communication, what patients want, what they don't want, and more. So check that out, modernrehabmastery.com. Our next cohort starts in the end of October 2019. We plan on doing these live broadcasts um, probably at least twice a month. So if you guys have any questions, definitely hit us up on our various social medias. You can find me, Modern Manual Therapy, on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And where can you find you guys? I am back at, at a Rothschild PT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I am at, at Modus PT. Right. Andrew is having a branding crisis. So uh, you might find him at Sphere Fear Physio. That's true. Or at a, a Rothschild PT. It depends on the week. Uh, day 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 not the week all right we'll see you guys good night good night see ya